Thank you for joining us on the Winning at Selling podcast. I'm Bill Hellcamp of Reach Development Systems, and with me is Professor Scott Plum of the Minnesota Sales Institute. Compensation is the reward for work and risk. Sales leadership has a standing goal of rewarding the behavior you want to instill and inspire, and strategy will determine the greatest profit margin and market dominance. How can we align strategy, compensation, and revenue projections? Look into the archives and retrieve that business plan and let's update the strategy, compensation, and relaunch our products and services as Bill and I discuss sales compensation plans, that and much, much more on episode 458 of Winning and Selling Podcast. Wrapping up the book, Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. We are in chapter 15, more years of life and more life in your years. This chapter started off a little goofy for me, Scott. He was trying to get into medical stuff and serums, and I didn't understand what he was talking I, about. But how I, about I you? didn't either. Yeah, The oh, first okay. half of the chapter was really difficult to follow and understand, and I couldn't link it back to anything that he said in the previous chapter. So it could have stood alone for as yeah. much as I cared about well, the chapter. Well, I might be a lazy reader, but I find that most books that I read, all of these informational books like this, should end about three chapters before they do. Mm. They just start to get repetitive and I'm not learning anything new. So I think he talks about some interesting things in this chapter, but it's not really that much different from what he talked about before. It's just putting this more life in your years spin on it. So yeah. each thing is really kind of talking about the same issues, but from a different standpoint. Yeah, he did kind of bring back some of the stuff he talked about in the first chapter when he's dealt with or talked about healing wounds related to stress. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference between a surgeon making an incision and maybe getting into an accident and cutting yourself and how one wound is easier to heal than the other one. But one thing that I took away from the chapter was he listed the six basic needs that every human being has. Okay. And I think we can look at that and go, well, that, that's pretty evident, I think, in any role that we have, because, you know, we're all human beings. And, and it's very similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, very much. So the first one is the need for love. Uh, no surprise there. Mm -hmm. I think we all want to give love and, and, and receive love. The next one is the need for security seems to be pretty normal in, in any relationship or I think that's real different though in people, right? There's some people have a real strong need for security and probably each of these yeah. is probably the same that you may look at any of these six items and see one that you feel more strongly about than others. I think, you know, you and I are both entrepreneurs. We probably have less of a need for security than some other people who want to work at a big company and just feel that they're going to take care of them. And sometimes security could be uh, security in the opportunities that you get, you know, this is your area to go and mm -hmm. leverage that. So mm -hmm. I've got security in my territory. So I get to generate the revenue in my territory. This is my territory. Right. So you have security right. and an opportunity within your territory. Some people will look at security and say, you know, hey, I believe my security is at the end of my arm, my ability to work and do something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if I'm working for myself or a large company. It's all up to me anyway. So I might as well, you know pick this thing, which I feel most comfortable in. Yeah. All right. What's the, the next, next one? Next one is a need for creative expression. And he talked a little bit about this earlier with kind of the, the need to be able to a motivation, I guess, is what it was. That we brought up a, a few episodes ago is that creative motivation where we feel like we've got something to say to somebody else, mm -hmm. or we want to share something that we've learned. And sometimes with, in this role of a salesperson, we're, we're talking with people and they say, you know, I just figured this out, you know, da, 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 da. and as a salesperson, we say, you know, that's, that's really great. Yep. Instead of saying, I, I know, I knew that all the time. <laughs> so I we tried to really, tell you that before. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we, you only learned that because I told you. <laughs> we take well, all the wind about, out of their sail. So. That's right. Well, he talks about creativity as being an essential life, force of life, right? Mm-hmm. And that creativity, if we don't generate creativity in something, then that's one area where we're not going to have enough years in our life or enough life in our years. Yeah. And I think wonder is really important with creativity. I think we always have to have a spirit of wonder. Change begins with wonder. I wonder what would happen if I were to do this. We talked right. about suppose, you know, suppose this were to be happen, you know, being negative or suppose this were to happen being positive. I think that so, supposing and that wonder is a great way to be better at prospecting. 
Mm -hmm. or to meeting people. I wonder what that person has to tell me. I wonder what that person's like. I wonder if I can get an appointment with this person. And instead of worrying about whether they're going to reject you, create that sense of wonder that says, let's make this an adventure rather than a painful experience. Yeah. Little sidebar, I watched a great movie last night called Seven Days in Utopia with Robert Duvall. It's on Amazon Prime. It's free. It's a great movie. Um, Must be Rob- good if it's free. Oh, well, Robert Duvall. <laughs> I just I just wanted to watch another Robert Duvall movie after that. Go. He's such a great actor. Yeah. The is. next one is uh, Need for Recognition. I think this is a big motivation for salespeople. It's probably mm-hmm. one of the top five is to be appreciated and recognized. And this is part of that intrinsic motivation that we talked about mm-hmm. a few episodes back. To be, I can remember when I was was in the company, large national company, and wanting to get up on that stage at the awards presentation and be one of the top salespeople. Yeah, that's a tremendous motivation to mm-hmm. do that. Next one is the need for new experiences, and I think this is really important as sales, as being a salesperson, is every day is is different, and if we continue to repeat the same day over and over, the same week over, the same month over, nothing new is going to happen. No change no change. And Mm -hmm. we start to get burnt out. We start to get complacent. Our selling skills start to dull. We really need to take risks and create new opportunities and new experiences. Yeah. Speaking of movies that your, your thought reminded Mm -hmm. me of groundhog day. Oh yeah. And if you've watched that, you know, early on, he's not trying to get better, but once he decides he's going to start getting better at things, even though he's reliving, reliving the same day over, he's gaining skills and he's more enjoying his time more and almost regrets it when, when the cycle is broken. And speaking of Robert Duvall movies, <laughs> there's another one, Days of Thunder, old, old movie with Tom Cruise. And there's one scene in that movie where Tom Cruise is complaining about the car and Robert Duvall's character is complaining about the driver. <laughs> and it was like these two people were at odds with each other as to what's going to change. Is the driver going to change or is the car going to change? And Robert Duvall was the older character. And he said to the driver, what is it that you want me to change about the car? And then Tom Cruise finally admitted that he didn't know much about the car. Mm-hmm. He, he didn't know what to change in the car. But the, the understanding of the two of them working together, figuring out a solution was the real goal. And sometimes we want our sales managers to change. And sometimes our sales managers want us to change. And we need to be able to focus on what's best for both parties in getting the desired outcome. And working well, and sometimes salespeople work on pure talent. Hmm. Uh, they're, they're glib, they're fun, they're nice people. They listen okay. And, and they can get so far in sales just by being a pleasant, kind, thoughtful person. But if, uh, if they don't get better at it, they're not going to really reach the heights. And so uh, I know that uh, John Maxwell wrote a book, I think it's called Talent is, is Never Enough or Talent Isn't Enough. Mm. And he talks about you can only get so far in your talent, but then you have to start to get better at things. And that new experiences then can help us. We can get new experiences if we get better. What's the last one? Last one is the need for self-esteem. And I think that this is really carrying a positive outlook, looking for opportunities and not living with limitations. Mm-hmm. And it's, it can be easy for us to, to do that. Many summers ago, I was riding around on a boat with a good friend of mine on Lake Minnetonka. For those of you that are not from the Twin Cities area, it's a huge lake west of the city. And there's a lot of beautiful houses on Lake Minnetonka. And we're riding around and I'm standing next to a young lady that I've known for many years. And she says out loud, I can't imagine what it's like to live in one of those houses. And I turned to her and I said, don't worry, it'll never happen. <laughs> and, and she got pretty ticked at me as she should have. And I wanted her to get ticked right. at me for saying that. I said, here's what I think you meant to say is I wonder what it would be like to live in one of those houses. We really need to open up our self-esteem, our wonder, our self-worth and look at opportunities and go, I wonder what it would be like to be able to live in one of those houses Mm -hmm. instead of, I can't imagine what it would be like to be a top producer. I can't imagine what it would be like to, to double my revenue goal. So I wonder what it would be like to double my revenue goal. Wow. It's so different. It just makes me feel so different. Just saying that. And I think that's what's so important about this last chapter, and that is you can't stop living later in your life or any time in your life. I I heard, I heard, was it Ben Franklin that said that most men are dead at 24 and just waiting for their body to catch up? And they haven't buried the body. Yeah. Yeah, And so I think we we can't live that way. We need to have this focus on the future, this 
ability to set goals, the ability to move ourselves forward and always be enthusiastic about what's coming rather than just waiting for things to end. Some people have their car covered with so many decals and so many windows are covered with decals. They can't see what it looks like going forward. They're so covered in the past. That's right. <laughs> where that's they been? Right. All right. <laughs> can't see where we're going. Well, I think we need to think about where we're going and that's a good way to wrap up. Psycho Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. What's, what's up next? We're going to be doing another uh, great book on the sales process. So this one is Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play, Transforming the Buyer-Seller Relationship by, you can say the names better than I can, Bill. I think it's Mahan Khalsa, but this is, he's part of the Covey Group. Yeah, exactly. And so they do very fine work. So I'm looking forward to this book. We've got nine chapters. Some of them are a little thicker than the others. We're going to try to get through each one of them on, on each episode, but we might have to break them up. Yeah, we'll, but, we'll look uh, at each one as we read through it. And if it feels like it needs to be broken, we'll, we, we might break it up. So might not be able to tell you that in advance. We might decide that right before we go to go on air. This segment has been brought to you by the Jumpstart Sales Coaching Program, presented by the hosts of the Winning at Selling podcast. Every professional athlete has a coach, someone to assist and advise. Tiger Woods had four swing coaches so that he could stay at the top of his game. What would you like to improve or overcome in the next year? Perhaps as a salesperson, you want to be more productive with your prospecting, overcoming objections, or delivering more effective presentations. As a sales manager, you want to create a spark within your sales team with a new message, a refreshed approach to starting new conversations with the prospects, or you are looking for market-ready strategies to increase revenue and shorten the sales cycle with your existing team. Or as a business leader, you want to transform the sales culture and your value proposition for the new marketplace. Whatever your reason, this is the perfect time to engage with an experienced sales coach. That is why your hosts of Winning and Selling Podcast, Professor Scott Plum and Bill Hellcamp, have developed the Jumpstart Sales Coaching Program. Now you can receive personal coaching from the same sales professionals you enjoy on this podcast. It all starts with a discussion to give us insights into your specific goals, challenges, needs, and motivation. Go to winningatselling.com to contact Bill or Scott about the Jumpstart Sales Coaching Program. Do you believe you deserve better results? Now is the time to invest in yourself, your people, and your customers, and invest in your future. So our topic today is on sales compensation. I'm kind of curious, who's listening to this episode? Is it the salespeople or is it sales managers or is it the business owners when it comes to sales compensation? Because we're talking about a very emotional issue for everybody that's involved. And I, I really believe that the first question that the leader of the company needs to really ask themselves is, how should the priorities of the business be represented in the sales compensation plan? Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, we're going to reward the behavior we want to instill and inspire. So if we're inspiring people to take action, we're motivating them. We're moving them emotionally to do something, to be able to take some risk and to get a reward for that risk. And sales is a very difficult position, job, role to measure. Now, we can add some measurables with behaviors, with activities, et cetera, but it, it's very objective when it comes to the application of talent and skills, Bill. Does that sound pretty accurate? Anything I left well, I out? Think it's, I think it's, and, and many of those talents and skills are, are deceptive or hidden. I, I know that I talk with people quite often in organizations and they'll, they'll say, the non-sales people sometimes will say, those salespeople get paid too much. They don't do anything but go out and play golf. And then I say, well, how about you? Would you like to sit down and make, you know, 50 cold calls in a week? Well, I don't right. want to do any of that. Right. And so it's the hidden things that keep us going that people just don't want to do. And it's paid well because it takes a unique set of skills and a unique set of abilities to go out and do the things that a salesperson needs to do. And rewarding those things is important and not screwing up those rewards and, and rewarding for the wrong things and being surprised. Mm -hmm. I know at the end of this, I want to talk about some of the mistakes that uh, companies make in these plans. Mm -hmm. Sales is the engine that pulls the train. 
Nothing happens until a salesperson sells something. I don't care if it's a goods, services, whatever. Nothing happens until a salesperson sells something. You can have a warehouse full of goods, but if a salesperson does not sell the goods, mm -hmm. there is no revenue. And it doesn't matter what anybody does within the organization. If we're not selling something, we're not generating revenue and nobody's getting paid, period. Right. And I, I know that there's some caveats to that, but salespeople, the sales revenue that comes in is just so critical. And we're going to talk about some areas of having an influence in the priorities of the business is what compensation really boils down to. Okay. So I've got four, four areas. We'll start with the first one is insight. So we really need to be able to have some insight into the marketplace. We need to be able to know what our customers want what um, our competitors are like. And we need to be able to describe that and, and to be able to capture that so that we can build on what is the marketplace like out there? What is the mm -hmm. voice of the customer when it comes to what are we hearing from them? What problems do they have? And then what needs to be solved? What, yeah. what, what do we solve in the marketplace? Yeah. And the competitors. I mean, our competitors, you know, sometimes we get tempted to compete with competitors versus being market leaders and being a leader in the marketplace instead of focusing our priorities off of being a competitor and doing something different. But maybe... Well, I think it's knowing where our place is in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. There are some companies that are leaders and there's other companies that are copiers and sell it at a lower price. For example, when you think of sodas, you probably think of Coke and Pepsi being the market leaders and really driving the market. And you might have a company like Royal Crown or some other smaller cola that follows. And, and their goal really is to have an okay cola that is sold cheaper than the, than the competitors. So it, you have to know where your place is in that marketplace. You may not be that market leader. You may be a different kind of leader. You may be a value leader. Just know where that place is. The next area is strategy. So we need to be able to determine the territories, laying our territories out. We need to look at our value proposition. What value are we offering to the marketplace? Why do customers buy from us? We also need to look at our objectives. And we've talked about objectives in past episodes. We've mm -hmm. got behaviors, which are making so many phone calls. Let's say 50 phone calls a day. Right. I'd call um, those activities, but yeah. 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 Activities. But objectives are, you know, hands on the wheel foot on the gas. So foot on the gas is making all those calls and that, those activities. Hands on the wheel is who are we going to be calling? Mm -hmm. Monday morning, who are we? How do we prioritize? And how the value do we look proposition at, is what are we saying to them that is going to generate enough interest to move us to the next step? Yeah. And then also looking at some of our measurables. There are mm -hmm. some things that are measurable in the role of, of sales. I mean, our activities, our calls, our contacts, how many new calls are we making? How many existing clients and customers are we following up with? How many appointments we get? How many proposals we do? How many closed sales we have? What is our average sales rate? What's our average sales cycle? We also you know, want to work on increasing our closing rate and shortening our sales cycle. But the only way that we can really do that is to measure it first. Right. You cannot manage what you do not measure. And you need to, as a sales leader, look at whether those measurables are bringing the results that you want. So let's say, for example, you say to your, to your, to your team, uh, you need to make 15 new calls a day, and that should lead to three new appointments a day, and that should lead to X number of sales. And somebody is really working that plan, and they're finding that 15 calls only leads to two appointments a day, and then we don't hit the X number of sales. The goal shouldn't change. Well, we'll just cut, we'll, we'll say you only need to make two thirds of your sales. No, maybe you need to make 20 calls a day to get those three appointments. So, so look at the plan on a regular basis to see if your measurables and your activities are reaching the objectives that you've set out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, good advice. And the next step is customer engagement, which is really defining the sales process, mm -hmm. getting involved in internal roles within- Sales process, this. what's that? I just go yeah. talk to them and then <laughs> yeah. sometimes they buy and- The sales process is looking at the objections that you get and figuring out how to eliminate them, period. 
right. then refining the sales process to be able to deal with everything so that objections don't occur, which are stalls, put offs, etc. Um, a lot of people now are talking about a buying process. So getting better in tune with how the customers buy. Uh, I think it's probably a merge, you know, you, you have to lead them sometimes, but they also, you also have to be sensitive to where they are and how they want to move through the process. Yeah. I've also heard customer journey Mm -hmm. is the similar vernacular for that. But when we look at sales process, it implies that the salesperson is in charge is leading the buyer, the prospect through the sales process and as Frank Cespedes said in a in previous episode, is helping them make a change and helping them discover value and being that guide through the process and making the prospect feel safe Correct. and taking a risk and change, which I thought was a very good application. But again, you guide them with a sensitivity toward where they want to go as well, right? I always talk right. about kind of being on the tracks. You have a track that you've laid out. And you want to move them along that, but sometimes they go off on the side rails for a little bit and you have to be comfortable with taking them on that journey. And then knowing what your process is to bring them back to a a solid movement forward. Yeah. Internal roles. How are salespeople being supported? Is there a support team? Are there sales operations? How does marketing fit into supporting sales? What kind of information can sales give marketing to create better collateral material? Mm, and then, not enough and, communication between sales and marketing. Uh, They're often yeah, at odds yeah. with each other. Yeah, and collaboration. I mean, there, there's, you know, and, and I worked in a newspaper. And I was, guess what? I was selling advertising and sponsorships. And who was I working against? It seemed like I was working against editorial. Mm-hmm. And we just seemed to always be at each other's uh, throats when it came to what do we want to get out of the newspaper? Correct. And I always said, there is not enough revenue generated in subscriptions to pay for the editorial staff. So if you want to be able to support your editorial staff, we need to sell advertising. So make right. it easier for me to sell advertising, please. Uh, and then the last one under customer engagement is post engagement, which is if somebody doesn't buy today, how do we stay in touch with them? How do we, if, and when somebody does buy today, how do we stay in touch with them? So how's the post engagement being managed so that we're staying top of mind awareness and maybe the opportunities changes, or maybe we change our solution. And now prospects look at us differently too. Right. And if we don't reward some post engagement, there will be none. Yeah. Unless there's somebody else in the organization who's responsible for that. But if, if you only reward, so talking about this as a compensation plan, if you only reward the sale, then you're only going to get the sale. If you don't reward that they're a customer for a long time, or you don't reward uh, the growth of the customer, then that customer will stagnate because the salesperson has no incentive to go back in there and continue to make that sale happen. And what a lot of companies do is they punish you. So, so if you're, if the sale drops off because they don't pay you for doing something, well, then they'll take money out of your pocket because the sale went away. It's, that's a, I think that's a real hinky area that not enough companies think about is that what happens after the sale and how do we compensate long-term? Just in that, that statement, Bill, you, you identified and, and reinforced that it's the priorities of the business that determine this entire process is so often, I, I think we need to, to look at the priorities of everybody in the sales channel and within the company of the entire business and look at the reputation that a company wants to have in the marketplace. And everything that we've talked about is before we even get into compensation, right. which is right. the next step, is, is that enablement, which includes the compensation, what kind of training do we offer and what kind of resources do we offer mm-hmm. the sales team? And that brings everything together in supporting the priorities of the business and managing the reputation and to be able to maximize the revenue at the same time. Yeah. I think that uh, now, you know, you didn't really talk in this whole thing about what that compensation should pay like, but I think that's one of the challenges that companies face quite often is that they invent. So I want to go through a couple of issues that companies are going to run into. And one of them, is that they're sometimes shocked when a star performer breaks the system. Mm -hmm. Sales managers and owners develop this compensation plan and they think, okay, well, you know, maybe they'll make 120 or $140,000 a year and the sales manager's getting paid 160 and he's okay with that. And then all of a sudden you've got a star performer who's making 180, 200,000 based on the compensation plan. And the sales managers or the owners start to wet themselves 
that somebody actually did what they wanted them to do. And then they go back and change the plan or shrink their territory and the star performer quits and they're shocked. So one of the things to watch out for is that sticker shock that you get. So if you're going to do a compensation plan, look into the future and say, am I okay if a star performer, if she really breaks the system on me and starts to make a lot of money for us? Well, a good owner will think, yeah, they're selling a lot and that's what we want them to do. But they get a little bit scared when someone's making too much money. It, it seems like there's these self-imposed norms within companies. Mm -hmm. I was working with a company last week and the, the sales manager said that when they hand a lead off to a salesperson, there's usually a closing rate of about two to 3%. I'm going, what? Wow. <laughs> that's not what? a lead. That's well, no, that's and, no better than uh, I was shocked. walking through a crowd. <laughs> but there was no shock in the, the sales manager saying that. And I'm like, my goodness, you have created a norm here where you have enabled that closing rate to be acceptable. When in reality, I think incoming lead. Somebody in marketing ought to be shooting. Oh, them at, you know, yeah, sort of should be, that. you know, north of 50 percent, right. like around 80 percent. Right. In most cases, to the course, point where they're calling you or contacting, say, tell me more. So we get uh, even these, if you're even if you're only one of three ought to get one yeah, out of the, three. These norms that that yep. you know are self-imposed because that's the way it's always been. Right. And the management ends up seeing somebody that's a superstar. They come in, and what are they going to do with the superstar? Are they going to you know introduce them to the norms that are happening right now, or look at the <laughs> opportunities and say you know there's a chance here that you could double your quota? Yeah, there is a chance to doing that. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. There is always and that's a chance. what we're hoping for, to find. And you're hoping to find that 20% of star performers that Frank Cespit has talked about. And we hope to get those people, but don't screw them up. Once you find them, they're unicorns. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. don't screw up their compensation plan by shrinking their territory. Once you find them, I, I, if I find a champion, get them an inside salesperson to help that individual, uh, get that individual some long-term help find out what they're really good at and, and throw gasoline on that fire. When I started in sales, I started selling real estate. I remember my broker said to me, you know, nobody really makes it in real estate, uh, you know, until the first two years. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to get a part-time job and then I'm going to work there and just wait. Until I guess two I got years two years passes. to fail. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why would you say that to somebody? Yep. Yep. You, you know, you usually can't make it for the first two years. You end up starving. It's like, well, you know, I don't believe that. And why would you want to tell me that when I end up taking a very passive approach? And then I expect failure because everybody else is right. struggling and failing. My son worked at a company as an engineer. And, and when he got there within the first week, his boss told him, you know, we don't promote or give a lot of raises. So if you're going to get some more money, you're going to have to go to a different company. Mm. It's like, wow, what are we working here for? Yeah. So anyway, the number two thing I have is rewarding the wrong behaviors or selling style. You talked about it a lot. Compensation should align with the company goals. And then you should make sure that you're rewarding what does the most important things for you. Uh, a lot of companies, they'll put spiffs on things and then be surprised if people sell a lot of those. Uh, they'll, they'll reward a certain activity and then be surprised that that activity isn't the only thing that their salespeople do. So make sure that you understand salespeople are going to generally do what gives them the highest reward. So make sure that those behaviors and selling processes are the things that you want them to achieve. I will add to that with the least amount of work. <laughs> the highest reward for the least amount of work. Salespeople, uh, you know, I'm telling the truth. Don't, don't, don't scoff at me. You know, I'm telling the truth. Do you want the highest reward for the least amount of work? And what do you do? You sell the stuff that's easiest to sell, right. period. Right. The shortest sales cycle, the highest closing ratio, and you just kind of make it up in volume. And you just keep doing that over and over again. And, and hey, if management's happy with that, great, fabulous. Right. If they want to assign a, a different compensation program for a different type of product or service, and you want to spend some time investing in that, then great. Here's a matrix, though, that management want to, should consider is in order to get a compensation on the stuff that's easy to sell, it has to be X percentage of your monthly revenue. Anything that is higher than this or doesn't reach us, 
percentage in other areas, then it has a different compensation program. So say, well, 60% of our revenue can be in this area. And then the 40% of the area have to be within these products over right. here. Right. And that's part of the objectives that leadership has is that we not kind of concentrate just on one product that's easy to sell, period. And that's my third issue is that we tend to stick with the same plan every year. Yeah, uh, it, It's hard to do a compensation plan. It's hard to think it through. And so sometimes sales managers or leadership will just say, oh, let's just do the same one we did last year. And it's not meeting the company goals. Your company goals are changing, being modified every year. Your compensation plan in order to stick with those goals needs to be modified every year. Look at it, redo it, think it through and come up with a little bit better plan every year based on what you know, what happened and, and how people responded to the plan last year. When Xerox came out, they were, the salespeople were selling copies. They own the machine, the companies lease the machine and they were selling copies. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how the product was sold. As some of the other copiers came onto the market from Japan, et cetera, then Xerox started selling machines to compete with the other machines. So the sales process had to change significantly. The positioning of value had to change significantly. And then the compensation obviously had to change significantly because how we sold changed. That's right. And now HP basically gives away the printers yeah. and, and sells you at an exorbitant price, the ink or right. you lose your, so it's just changed. All right. My final one is that they have the same plan for everyone. If you look at your sales team, you may have different types of salespeople. You might have inside salespeople. You might have people that are rainmakers. They're good at going out and finding new business. And then the ones I call the farmers, the ones that are good at keeping business and, and, and making business grow, but they're not good at rainmaking. If you have those different types of salespeople, then you need to have a different plan that rewards different behaviors for each one of those. Don't throw it all across the board and say, okay, we're going to, everybody's going to have their own type of, or their, uh, the same compensation plan. They're all doing different things. And, and this really brings me to a, a point that I think is very important for sales leadership. You shouldn't only have one type of salesperson. You shouldn't have a rainmaker who's trying to do inside sales and be a farmer at the same time. You're really wasting their time. I have a friend of mine that works at an organization and uh, they compensate their salespeople way into the six figures. And then they have them, their printer, and then the, the owner makes them watch the printing process. So instead of out selling new things, they're making sure that the product is being produced properly. And it's like, well, isn't that what your traffic person is supposed to do? Well, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that the customers are happy. Then you have the right type of people at every type of job so that the customers are happy, but don't have your salespeople in doing inside sales work if they're supposed to be out creating new sales. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, good advice. We welcome your comments, feedback on some of the challenges that you have within the company. If you're a salesperson with compensation or sales leadership, Bill and I are, are here to give you the resources and, and give you some of our opinions on sales compensation. It is a very emotional area, like I said at the beginning, and it's it's really important to be able to figure a way out where everybody wins when it comes to And if to you do it wrong, you'll lose your best people, not your worst. That's so true. This segment of Winning at Selling podcast is brought to you by The Art of Prospecting, your guide to getting in the door by Steve Cloyda. Steve Cloyda was known internationally for increasing salespeople's ability to make solid appointments with qualified prospects. You too can learn this essential skill by ordering a copy of his superb book, The Art of Prospecting, your guide to getting in the door. In this book, Steve shares the top strategies and tactics he has developed, implemented, and personally tested with more than 1 million sales and prospecting calls. You can get his book on the website, theprospectingexpert.com. In addition, check out his other great online resources. Instant Sales Coaching, which will guide you through five online success modules. A guided prospecting process entitled Call Reluctance Transformer, and the Magnetic Selling Strategies Workbook, a detailed step-by-step -step guide to increasing your sales. Get any of these valuable resources at theprospectingexpert.com. We'll, we'll wrap up today's podcast with our golden nugget. This is from Stephen Covey. I'm not a product of my circumstances. I am a product of my decisions. Mm. Wow. 
good. And I'm wondering how many decisions do we make in a day? Oh, everything we do is a decision. Every minute of, of how we spend every minute of the day is a decision. And if we're not prepared for it, we're not going to make the right decisions. That's why planning your day is so important. I was talking with uh, a parent of a 14 year old and the 14 year old was making bad decisions. <laughs> and and <laughs> which, I said, which is what their goal in life is. At yeah. I said, here's the premise. Your freedom is going to be determined by the decisions you make. You make bad decisions. Your freedom is going to be restricted. You make good decisions. You're going to have greater freedom. It's really up to you. Yep. Have a good day. It's very simple. <laughs> I mean, I know I'm sorry. It's not simple with the 14 year old. Okay. You got me there. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for listening. Thanks for paying attention. I told my folks. kids, you got to know the program. If you behave, good things happen. If you don't, bad things happen. My oldest son, he knew the program. Right. My middle son, he wanted to fight the program. You can't fight the program. Go out and make good decisions every day. Yeah, I'll add a golden nugget on Les Brown. Love Les Brown. Les Brown says, if you do what's easy, life will be hard. If you do what's hard, life will be easy. Mm. It's real simple. And I go, I get it, Les. Thanks. You're right on. <laughs> You're right on, man. All right. So everything that we talked about will be at the website winning at selling.com. Again, Bill and I welcome your comments, your feedback, share this episode, download past episodes, really tell us what you like, what we want, what you want us to include and what we can do to add value to you as a listener. Thanks for listening. Next week, we are going to start Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play by Mahan Khalsa. And we will go over the forward, the preface, and the introduction. Scott, like he wrote a preface in his book, and he says, you better read it. So we're going to go over those. But that really sets up the book for us. This is what the author wants us to know and understand as we get started. Our topic will be Scott and I's top tips for selling more. So we'll go through three or four tips from each of us. Go out and get better one skill at a time. Joyful selling. Joyful selling.